So if this is what we covered during the last um, during the last class. We we notice that uh, we should not dismiss any information, right? Some information affects probability, other information does not affect the final calculation of probability, but all information is important. You agree? Because uh, what happens is that each information that you hear makes the universe more definite. So uh, the, the possibilities for the types of universes in which you are residing is um, getting limited. So here is, a, again, a very simple example. Two fair coins are tossed. What is the probability that first coin lands heads up? So most students, what do they do? They say, well, uh, we are not interested in the second coin, correct? The second coin is not affecting the first coin. So our sample space, they would say, is first coin heads or first coin tails. And then they calculate the probability that heads comes up is to be one half if the coin is fair, right? Mm -hmm. So it does not create a mistake in this situation, but you have to be careful because that's not necessarily how I, uh, for example, think about the, this problem. The second coin is also part of the universe and what you're truly counting are possible universes, right? So you, are, you, 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 you need to somehow justify why should you reduce the universe that you're dealing to just uh, one coin. What, what, what you can imagine doing in general is this is our, our universe with only two coins. There are four possibilities and each universe here is equally likely and there are two universes out of four with the desired property. So the answer is really two over four. Yes, you can say the answer is one half, but two over four means two universes having, uh, out of all possible universes uh, that we can consider, two of the universes have the right quality of uh, first coin being heads, and uh, four universes are possible in total. That's also, by the way, not true, because when we toss the coins, obviously we are not tossing them in a vacuum. So you might say we are ignoring everything else. Yes, we're ignoring uh, what, what, what color of table do I have when I toss the coins, in what room I am, uh, in what time, space, all sorts of things. Yeah, so there's an enormous amount of information that is being ignored here. Now, here is uh, what I imagine doing instead, right? So instead of uh, actually ignoring the second coin, I actually imagine that I know definitely it came out to be heads. Okay, so I still have two possibilities, but I do not ignore the second coin. I actually imagine I know about it far more than I actually do. Because when I toss it, it's unknown whether it comes up heads or, or tails, but I'm assuming I am residing in a universe where let's say the second coin happened to be heads. And you will see below uh, that this assumption, if, if you think, well, why, why are you wasting our time talking about it? Let's see if you say the same thing when I, when I ask the next question, okay? So, here is uh, my premise is that you can assume instead of deleting information actually add information assume that you know far more than you actually do okay which which is what i did over here with the second coin i assume that uh, that uh, i actually know what was the outcome on it okay and uh, in general this is the kafka protocol for the universe that i assume when i just toss two coins right i just don't mention everything else but i assume a giant humongous tremendous insane a document of uh, enormous length, you know, where uh, where everything is accounted for. But of course, you don't want to fill in uh, this paperwork. So you imagine everything but those two boxes uh, are filled in, you understand? So you are residing in a particular universe and the information about this universe is marked in other boxes. And there are only two boxes that are being uh, empty, right? So when you write the Kafka protocol, what you actually imagine is that the other other segments are filled in. And so they are, you suppress this information, you understand? You, make it, you, you, you press a button and you make it invisible. And then your universe is just those two coins. So far good? Let's see how you uh, see this problem, guys. We have uh, uh, 52 cards and they are going to be dealt in a game of bridge equally among four players. The players are East, West, North and South. If North and South have a total of eight spades among them, what is the probability that player East has three of the five remaining spades? Question clear?
Kotaro, you're saying what one six? Okay, what about the rest of you guys? So you're being bold, some of you, I see. We can think uh, of several ways to, to deal with this problem, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bishak, thank you. There are several uh, ways to solve this problem. Total are 52 cards, yes. Uh, so Kazi, when you say maybe, maybe it's, um, I mean, we'll see, we'll see in a moment, guys. I'm not really, you know, my head is kind of. The car, there are, there are 52 cards, in total. All right, ready. All right, let's solve it together. So, and uh, we can do it in maybe uh, several suggestions. Good. So let's see. So first of all, in terms of this problem, we can solve it again. I'm showing you, um, this question is to show you that we can assume far more than we do, okay? We can deal directly with uh, the cards. That's one, one solution that I wrote over here. So let's say uh, we can assume that what happened is that uh, we know the exact cards that are shared between East and West. You understand 26 cards were given to North and South. Eight of those cards are spades. I can pretend that I know, you see, I don't know in this problem which particular cards, which particular spades and which particular other cards are given to North uh, and South. Right? But I can, I can imagine that I, in fact, have far more information, that I have some, because you understand, you, you can imagine you are jumping through universes and you calculate the probability in each universe where you might be located, right? So in one universe, it's uh, spades one through five, whichever that means, you see, one through five that are uh, among uh, East and West, and the other cards, are, you can label them as you like, right? Or I jump in another universe, the particular spades are two through six that are shared by East and West, you understand? And each, each universe where I calculate this probability, 
I will get the same result. In some sense, that that's the intuition that uh, I have for it, okay? So I can assume that the situation is much more definite that I know exactly which 26 cards uh, are shared by East and West. And among those cards, exactly five very specific cards are spades. And so uh, what we have is uh, one probability is five choose three. Yes, five choose three. In other words, which particular three cards are belonging to East? Do they belong to East? And then uh, 21, because I cannot use any more of those five cards, there are 21 cards left from them. I have to choose 10 to complete the set for E. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that the cards that were not picked are the cards that West has. And that's divided by 12, choose 13. Yes? And uh, then when you simplify this answer, the answer is 0 0.3. Three nine. That's one way to solve this problem. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, one over six is um, well. What's one over six, guys? Well, Chabelli, why twenty six choose thirteen? Because uh, of the twenty six cards. It's really uh, to choose thirteen and choose thirteen. The cards that are not chosen. Those are uh, twenty six. Yes, you see. Um, uh, so one over six is not correct. I'm sorry, my head hurts. I'm uh, today not, you know, not not processing two nights of not sleep because of hunting of for this annoying thing. So I was night night problem first, right? <laughs> yeah, but I we, I caught this thing. The, the new cat, basically. Okay, so um, you understand, guys, why it's twenty six choose thirteen. It's the, it's the 26 cards that are shared by East and West. And I can pick 13 of those cards. 13 of those cards uh, will, be, will be given to, uh, to East. And the other 13, of course, are given to West. And I, pres and I assume that's my restricted sample space. I assume that I know which 26 cards are shared by East and West, right? So as soon as I know which of those 26 cards belong to East, I right away, of course, know which of those cards belong to West. But I will draw, right? I didn't write it in my notes, but I will draw another solution just in a moment, right? That I think would also work. Make sense? So uh, five choose three, uh, which particular spades out of the five available spades go to East times 21 choose 10 that those are the non-spade cards and from them I need 10 divided by any uh, choice of 13 cards from the 26 available and uh, 0 0.339 is is approximately what it is it's about uh, one third of something right one third ish so twice as much as you said maybe uh, somewhere you did not multiply by two what not uh, here is another solution that I think I can suggest guys uh, whiteboard so another solution i suggest is we can imagine that uh, we have a bunch of spaces and that the particular spaces uh, let's say there are 13 spaces and then there is this bridge after the 13 spaces and another 13 so spaces only spaces okay now the five, I only focus on the spaces occupied by five cards, right? So there are, there are going to be five of those 26 spaces are going to be occupied by, uh, by spades. So then um, the question is, any, it seems that any of the spaces are equally likely to be occupied by any of the available um, 26 cards or particular, any, any particular five, any collection of five is equally likely to uh, be anywhere, distributed anywhere. So what I need is uh, the probability that uh, I will have uh, that, that East has five, uh, sorry, three out of the five spades means that of the, of the 13, I need to choose three and of the other 13, I need to choose uh, the two, right? So that means uh, 13 choose three. Uh, let me write it somewhere else. And and check uh, if if I am you see because I, yeah, that's my intuition here. Just uh, I didn't think of it 
when I was writing the notes, I just thought of it now. So 13, choose uh, three. I'm choosing out of those uh, 13 spaces, three that will be occupied by spades. And out of the remaining 13, uh, west, you know, west of this line, I have uh, 13, choose two spaces to be occupied by the remaining, by the remaining two spades. And in general, the spades can occupy 26, choose five. Yes? So uh, what do we get? So approximately, let's see if we get the same number, I'll just calculate it quickly. But it's good if you're if you're being bold, so. Yes, and we get, uh, as I expected, we get uh, 0 0.339. So this procedure definitely gives us the same result. Just uh, verifying, okay? Makes sense, guys? So here I did it entirely, I used an entirely different strategy to calculate it. I just focused on the, sp on the spades and not even on the type of spades, but which boxes are available. Good? Yes, good. So uh, if I did it in two ways, that also in, in increases my confidence that I have not made any mistakes. But again, uh, the point of my example over there, uh, the more important point is notice, I assumed far more than I needed, right? In other words, not that I needed, sorry, I assumed far more than I knew. I knew that East and West have among them some five spades. Right, but I assume that I know the exact uh, spades that they both have and the exact uh, additional 21 cards, non-spade cards that they have. And, uh, my, and my calculation was uh, correct, you see? So it was like the coin example. Do you understand what I'm saying, guys? In the coin example, you, you, many of you, are, you think, uh, well, when I toss two coins uh, and I'm asked about the probability of the first coin, you think you ignore the second coin. It's you eliminate it out of existence because you think it's not important. And uh, what I do is I assume that the second coin I actually know its outcome. That's the difference in uh, in what most people do and what I decided to do here. Do you get it? So uh, I, I assume that the second coin I, I know exactly what it came up to be heads, let's say, and my probability is calculated correctly. Okay. Let's continue, guys. So to understand uh, uh, how that in general uh, works, how do we know that we can assume much more information that's available to us? In general, when, as, as I mentioned, when it was two coins, I think we are assuming that we know everything about the universe except for the outcome on those two coins. That's pretty incredible assumption yes i mean you don't we don't know nothing about the universe and yet we are making this assumption that we are omniscient so multiplication rule is the first thing that we need to develop so what it says is if we have sets or events e1 through en and they're all sub events of a sample space s and then to calculate the probability of the intersection of those events i need to calculate probability of E1 times probability of E2 given E1 times probability of E3 given E1, E2 and onwards, right? I basically uh, include this, uh, this extra assumption that E1 and E2 happen, then E1, E2, E3 happen and I calculate probability of E4 and onwards. And we can see that this rule is true because of something very simple, uh, just basic algebra. Yes, guys? So what I can do is I can, uh, I can write a telescoping product. Probability of E1 
uh, times probability e1 e2 divided by probability of e1 so you can see it crosses uh, the, the the numerator of the left term crosses with the denominator of the right term you see that and then next i multiply uh, by probability e1 e2 e3 divided by probability e1 e2 and again uh, numerator crosses denominator numerator from the left crosses denominator from the right and i continue doing that until i have reached uh, the probability of the intersection. Do you see that? So this is the last numerator. The, the only thing that could cross it out will be on the right. There is nothing on the right, so there is nothing crossing it out. Everything else is crossed out. You see, this denominator will be crossed by numerator on the left, this denominator by denominator on the, uh, on the, le on the numerator on the left and onwards, right? So you see, I can cancel everything, and the only thing that survives is uh, this intersection. It's telescoping. Are you with me guys? It's very important. We're understanding how I do this uh, multiplication of probabilities that you might have seen in elementary classes. Okay, and what is this? This is just the unconditional probability that E1 happens. And what is this? We remember the formula. This means uh, the probability that E2 happens given that E1 happened. And what is this? You see, E3 given that the remaining events happened. And we have this uh, product. Very important, guys, right? So uh, no questions so far. You understand how I was able to do it. If you are home, you are able to construct this argument without looking at the paper. It's very simple, yes? So it's, it's the multiplication of probabilities argument. So in school, they taught you, for example, if you toss two coins, what's the probability that both are heads? You're saying probability of first coin head is one half times probability of second coin head is one half, and you're saying one quarter. So that's why they were, they were using this multiplication pro property, okay? And independence, that's another thing that we'll talk about later. So here is another thing. Urn contains n balls and they are numbered one through n. K of those balls uh, will be removed sequentially without replacement in such a way that at each step, any one of the remaining balls is equally likely to be the one chosen. You understand? So, for example, first I have n balls. I remove one ball. Its probability, the one that I remove, its probability of being picked, is one divided by n. Now, for the remaining balls, each of them now n minus one balls. Each of them is equally likely to be the one removed next. So, show now that uh, the probability of any sequence is equally likely. You understand? We're trying to understand different notions of randomness. Here, uh, remember in chapter two, we are assume, we assume this randomness. We're assume that uh, if we have, if we, we have a sequence of uh, n balls, then the, the probability of every sequence is equally likely or the probability of any choice of K is equally likely. Now we're assuming, we're talking about uh, randomness in yet another uh, subtle way, right? We're just saying I remove one ball and its likelihood of being removed is uh, one over N. Once I remove this one, the probability of the next ball being removed uh, in each particular next ball to be removed is one over n minus one and onwards. Right? So that's what we're trying to establish. There are n choose k times k factorial sequences and we wish to show that the probability of each particular sequence is one divided by n choose k times k factorial. So far you understand what my goal is, right? I'm again showing that this new version of randomness is equivalent to the previous versions of randomness. Where we consider the, the full sample space, so to speak, yes? So here is one way to do that. So let's suppose that uh, E, I wrote K, I use the same letter, but let's say J, E sub J, event that J have chosen ball is ball number J. Okay, so that means E1 is the event that the first ball picked is one. E2 is the event that second ball picked is two and whatnot, right? So I want to calculate what's the probability of this intersection because that generates a sequence. And that will be according to this multiplication rule, probability of E1, in other words, probability that first ball chosen is one times the probability that second ball chosen is two given that first ball was E1 and onwards, yes? And then it's very easy to see that uh, the first probability is by by assumption it's one over n, next probability is one over n minus one, next probability one over n minus two, all the way to one over n minus k plus one. Yes? And if you calculate it, what is this? This is just uh, n choose k divided by k factorial in the denominator. 
It's, it's in other words, it's, it's the probability uh, one divided by its, its probability as a one full sequence string from the previous sample space. And uh, we can clearly do the same thing if we uh, select any other sequence, it will be the same probability. And thus, uh, this uh, one by one removal is equivalent to this idea that each, each sequence is the same, which I think you probably expected. Good. Everybody understood what I said here? It's slightly subtle and you think maybe you don't even care about this particular subtlety, but do you understand it? Okay, because remember when we talk about removing, let's say when we talk about a lottery, you can say random might mean that we select, uh, let's say five, five out of 42 balls. I don't remember how many they select. Five of the 42 balls sequentially, right? Each particular sequence equally likely. Or we're saying here one ball came out and it, 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 its probability of coming out was one over 42. Next ball coming out, its probability of coming out would be one over 41, right? And you're showing this way that uh, this notion of randomness, that each sampling is equally likely among the remaining, remaining ball types, that it's equivalent to the previous notions. And here, uh, let's right away return to the matching problem to illustrate uh, multiplication rule. I should then open the other lecture. Do you remember the matching problem, guys? It's about gentlemen and hats. This was the matching problem. You remember that? So you have N gentlemen, each of them has a hat, and uh, then they pick each a hat at random. The question is, what's the probability uh, that, uh, that no one picks their own hat? And we came up with the number e to the minus one when N is huge. Yes, so here is the next problem. If N gentlemen pick out a hat at random, what is the probability that exactly K of them pick their own hats? So exactly K. Where k could be one, two, three, just any number. See if you can uh, uh, solve it. I cannot give you too much time though. Thank you. 
Any noise comes through or you don't hear anything? It comes through. Well, that's the question, Kazi. That's very good, Nomi. Slight mistake, maybe a typo, but it's amazing. Slight mistake, see if you can detect it. Yes. All right, guys. So I'm sorry I give you so little time to think about it. I just want to rush through the materials. We have quite a lot to go through. Don't worry. I do hope I will recompense for your suffering and your loss on your exam. Right? That's why I haven't yet released it. Is first, I want you to prepare and solve the previous exams. I don't want my problems to go to waste. And the, the new problems, uh, I just I cannot... You know, there's just too many problems that I want to ask you and I cannot decide. Do I ask you this? Which is harder, which is more interesting? Okay, but I will release the exam uh, within this week. So by the weekend, I think you will have the exam. So here is the solution, my friends. So let E sub J be the event that JF gentleman picks his own hat. We are interested in the probability that exactly K people pick their own hats. And uh, by symmetry, I'm using symmetry to make it simple. I assume that that probability, well, I'm assuming that uh, I, I can focus on the last K gentleman picking their own hats. And if it's anybody else, it's just N choose K that I multiply by. You understand why I multiply by N choose K? Because it could be gentleman one, two, three, four, or the last K gentleman or any other combination of K gentlemen. So, and, all, and by symmetry, the prob there's nothing special about those gentlemen. If I just relabeled, uh, relabeled them, I can always assume it's uh, the last K. I hope you see the symmetry, okay? So, uh, so there are N choose K times this probability where uh, first through N minus K person don't pick their hat and the remaining K people the last K people pick their own hat. So then I can do it uh, by condition by, by conditional probability product of actually using it twice. All right, so how do I do it? It's this N choose K from before. And then uh, I, I, I'm saying, what's the probability? This product is just, uh, I take this to be one event and this to be the second event, yes? Just two events. So it's the probability of uh, this event times the probability of this event given the other. That's multiplication rule. Do you see it? I just, uh, inst so, uh, in, so again, I use E here. So we can say this here is um, F2 and this is F1. So, I'm so let's just label it in case that helps you guys. So this entire thing, this thing is F2. And this thing here is F1, yes? So I'm just saying that uh, that the probability here is the probability of F1, and this is uh, F2 given F1, 
Yes? You understand? I just, although there were many of them, I just broke it in just two. Okay? So, what is this probability? What's the probability that uh, gentleman n minus k plus one all the way to gentleman n pick their own hats? It means clearly that there are k people here that pick their own hats and the remaining people can do whatever they like. You know it, right guys? So there are n minus k factorial over n factorial possibilities, yes? Good. You understand this part, guys. Everybody does, right? It's like if you have a, a Jewish uh, mother, you would understand. Like, Do what you like, Bubale. I don't care. Marry who you like, right? Um, and by that, of course, she means n minus k factorial over n factorial. And the remaining probability, look at it. That's now, you can be clear, careful here, right? If we solve it, we already solved this thing, right? If the n minus k plus one all the way to en peaked their own hats. Uh, it, it's now the same situation, but we have n minus k gentlemen. You understand? Given the situation, it's like we have a smaller club and we solved this uh, in, in, we solved it already. We did all this hard work. We solved it already. Yes. So uh, we got this, remember? We got that if it were uh, n gentlemen, this is the summation, right? So now we just replace uh, k by j. I don't like to use uh, i or j. I prefer to use k whenever I'm, wherever it's available, but here I'll use j, yes? So this probability is just the same, the same matching problem from chapter two, but with fewer gentlemen, yes? So now I simplify this part is just one over k factorial and uh, this remains as it used to be. And then when I push n to infinity, it doesn't matter, it's n minus k or n, it will approach e minus one. So the answer is one over k factorial times e to the minus one. Got it? So guys, uh, we were you able to follow my explanation or was it too quick or, you understand? Um, I think so. Why is it become n over k times n minus k factorial over n factorial? Uh, why does it, what, what, do you, what do you say n over k? You mean n minus k factorial? n choose k, sorry. Yeah, where does that come from? Where the, ah, where this part comes from? It's because or, at the very, very beginning, it's, you see- No, I sorry, the, the, n, the n minus k factorial over, um, what was it, over n factorial. Ah, now this part. Mm -hmm. Where does this come from? Well, I, I cannot, I'm not too good at doing accents, but uh, that's what I meant it, it, with, with, with the Alan. It's a guilt tripping, right? It's, it means that, it means that uh, the last k people, they chose uh, their own hats. And this is the probability that the last uh, k people choose their own hats and the remaining can do whatever they like. So how many sequences do we have like this, right? Altogether, uh, we have n factorial sequences where I, I take all the n people into account. And here in the numerator, uh, there are only, the, the flexibility I have are on numbers one through n minus k because the last k people pick their own hats one through n minus k and I have a flexibility of, uh, of, of allowing them to do whatever they like. You understand? Because, so, that, so basically what I imagine, I imagine this Kafka protocol where the last K people, let's the, say the, 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 the N person is assigned hat number N, the N minus one person is assigned hat number N minus one, and the only unassigned, unassigned people are one through N minus K. Does it make sense? So they can do what they like, so to speak, right? Uh, pick whoever, wh wh whichever hat they like because they're not going to influence uh, the situation from, no, they're not, not going to cause uh, the last people not to pick their own hands. It's already given. Yes. So this probability is n minus k factorial over n factorial. I used uh, chapter two type of probability here. 
So I'm thinking of the entire set as just uh, how many sequences are possible. Good. And for this part, which is possibly the, the hardest part, I didn't bother thinking again. I already did the thinking in, uh, in this lecture note, yes? So I just realized this just means that uh, I have fewer gentlemen in my club. There are N minus K gentlemen in my club and I'm asking for the probability that none of those pick their own hats. And that happens to be this formula. You see, we have the same formula with just uh, more gentlemen, so to speak, right? And then when I push the number of gentlemen to infinity, K is fixed. So this approaches the uh, Taylor series for E to the minus one. And that will be then e to the minus one times one over k factorial. I hope it's clear, guys. Yes? A good movie to watch regarding that is Avalon. Have you ever seen the movie Avalon? It's a good movie. It's in fact American, right? Watch Avalon. Okay, great. We're moving rather fast. Now we talk about Bayes formula or the Bayesian formula. So it's pretty simple idea. So if we say, we can look at, uh, at the event E and we can break it into, uh, into two possibilities, either E and F happens or E and not F happens. You can see why that's true, right? S, the sample space equals to either event F happening or event not F happening, right? By the law of excluded middle. So that, and they're disjoint. So that means that probability of E is the same as probability of E intersected with F union F complement. And that's probability of E F union E F complement, which is probability E F plus probability E F complement. And here I use the multiplication rule, yes? I can say probability F times probability E given F plus probability E given F complement prob times probability F complement, clear? I, I went over that very fast and some of you, at least uh, one person I see looks despondent, looks very upset. I hope I'm not uh, wrong about it, right? Uh, then was, oh, sorry. If you are confused, guys, stay with me after class. I promise I, I will do everything I can to explain it very well. I feel like somebody drilled me through the eyes and you have to understand how, so I'm not really able to think too well. I don't know if my, my, my ability to talk today is good. So that's probability E given F times probability F plus probability E given F complement. And this is just one minus probability of F if you would like to see. You understand how I got this formula guys? It's, uh, it's, it's conditioning based on F happening and not F happening. And here is the first example. Yes. I have a question. So when you're saying F complement, you're assuming that if F doesn't happen, there's only one other option or I guess because like I get a little confused because if F doesn't happen or the F complement just kind of encapsulates. Well, if the F does not comp uh, happen, that means F, uh, not F happened. F complement is not F, right? It's yeah, so either, you're just saying I have it... blonde hair or I don't have blonde hair. Okay, so, okay. so it, it, en it encompasses every other possibility. Yes, because either you have something or you don't, at least uh, so it is assumed. Right? Uh, I don't know if it's true, you know, but, but either you have something or you don't. Okay, so that's the law of excluded middle. So either F happens or F complement happens. Okay, well, it's another way of saying uh, either F happens or it does not happen. Okay, so then here is uh, the first, uh, so you, you, the most important thing you, you see, you, you see how I go uh, from E to this and then uh, to conditioning. This is multiplication rule here. Right, so you see how you would you would calculate it, right? It's very simple. Once you have E F, it's now a probability of F times probability E F. That's just a multiplication rule involving two sets. Good guys. Yeah, you see, it's just pure logic. I hopefully you understand this formula. What it means? We talked about it. It's first lecture, and um, yeah. Insurance company divides people into two classes, accident prone and not accident prone. Statistics show that an accident prone person will have an accident within a year with probability 0.4, whereas this probability is 0.2 for non-accident prone individuals. If 30% of the population is accident prone, 
what is the probability that a new policyholder will suffer accident uh, within a year of getting the policy? The question clear, guys? So uh, you see probability is modified based on two possibilities. Either you're accident prone or you're not accident prone. Okay, and then the question is, uh, uh, what's the probability that you will have an accident? Clearly it's high or higher if it's an accident prone person and it's lower if it's not an accident prone person, right? So then you have to kind of reconcile between uh, those populations. Okay. Okay, a few of you have it. Let's uh, let's see what we say about it. Okay, guys, so it's about it's it's a matter of labeling and understanding why multiplication rule is working here, right? So we are the labels I, I made here is a event policyholder has an accident within a year, and I event the person is inclined to have an accident. I didn't want to use P because we're using P for probability. Yes. So then I, I do the following. What is the probability of having an accident? It's the probability of having an accident given accident prone times probability of being accident prone plus the probability of having an accident given that you are not accident prone times probability of not being accident prone. Everybody understands how this formula was uh, created. They just have uh, A is equal to AI union AI complement. And those probabilities are disjoint. And then I just have probability of AI and I condition on I, I make I the first event. So I use multiplication rule here. Yes. So you understand very important, of course, you realize why the conditional probability definition works, right? So that, that's how we can compress it. And that's how it makes sense to me. So then uh, uh, probability of having an accident given that you're accident prone is 0 0.4. Probability of accident prone is 0 0.3. 0 0.3 percent of the so 30 percent of the population here and then uh, the other part is accident if not accident prone is 0 0.2 why it is it's half as likely but the, the, there are more non-accident prone people 0 0.7 so altogether uh, the probability of an accident is 0.26 i just add those numbers together good now, new part of the question is, uh, now suppose that a person had an accident. What's the probability that person is accident prone?
All right, let's uh, look at it, guys. So this is the idea now. Okay, this is the idea. Probability that uh, the person is accident prone given that an accident did occur. So what can I do here? I can then convert it to the unconditional probability, probability of being, a, a, being accident prone and having accident divided by probability of having accident. Now the numerator I can rewrite. You see, I can rearrange it. Numerator I can rewrite as probability of having accident given accident prone times probability of accident prone. Everybody says this is, this is an important trick. You can always do that. The intersection, I can choose which is going to be my independent probability and which is going to be the condition probability. So I choose, because I have information about it, I choose uh, to read it like this. First, probability of I, then probability of A given I. Multiplication rule again. And I already calculated probability of having accident. So what we have is numerator is 0 0.4. The, that's probability of accident if a person is accident prone multiplied by 0 0.3, which is probability of being accident prone, divided by probability of having accident, which is 0 0.26. That ends up being 6 over 13, or about 0 0.46, so under 50%. Okay, so Chabelli, you are right. Do you understand how I got it, guys? Again, if, if you have the slightest problem, the slightest confusion, you talk to me. And also, I do hope you, you want to talk about the exams that you were practicing because you're so worried about uh, when the exam is coming, you were practicing, of course, right? You were studying, you were solving problems. Because I'm writing this stuff, right? So here is regarding exams. A multiple choice question with M possible answers appears on an exam. First question, by the way, what do you call such questions? Where you have, uh, uh, you have, let's say a question that has five solutions. What do you call it in Russia? Do you know? An American question. <laughs> it's an American test. They say it with spite. The probability that a student knows the right answer to this question is P. The probability that stu the student answers correctly by guessing is one over M. The Ru Russian sty style questions are like a preaching, you know, it's uh, what you do is you interrogate a person until they are, they are crying, then the next time they will know it for sure. Good. You understand my question, right? So um, we are doing it abstractly first and then we can put numbers to it. So we have a multiple choice question and let's say we ask this question maybe without the multiple choices, who, who knows, right? We asked about it uh, uh, from a certain population and we estimate that the probability of knowing an answer to it and a student um, in this class will know the answer with probability P and there are M possible answers. What's the probability that uh, the student uh, knows the answer if the question was answered correctly. We're assuming, of course, that uh, otherwise there was guessing and, and the probability of picking the right answer is one over M. Good? Thank you. 
Very good, uh, Abhishek. Wonderful. Very good. So let's uh, let's do it together, guys. Okay. So here is uh, here is how I approach it. Right. So K event student knows the right answer. C event correct answer has been given. So we want to know knowledge given that answer was correct. What's the probability? So it's much easier to answer it the other way around, uh, correct given knowledge, right? We, we may assume that if um, it's not true assumption, but if a person knows, let's assume he always answers it correctly. Uh, 
So first we have probability of, which is we have this condition of probability, it's probability of correct, of knowledge and answering correctly divided by probability of answering it correctly. The numerator can be conditioned into probability of knowing times the probability of correct answer given knowledge. The denominator is pro it's, uh, probability of correct and knowing plus correct and not knowing which can be broken thus. Are you with me guys? Right, uh, I'm not sure is this presentation, is material clear enough to you? I don't hear from enough students. So we have uh, this line here. Now numerator is what? We're assuming that a correct given knowledge is one. Always, always, it's not true by the way, but let's say that's, that is true. One times the probability of knowledge uh, divided by one times uh, the probability of knowledge plus one over M, that's the probability of correct given not no knowledge, that means guessing, times the probability of not knowing, which is one minus P. Now I can multiply numerator and denominator by M to make presentation nicer, right? So that would be MP here and MP here minus P, which is M minus one times P and uh, there is going to be the plus one here. So I can present my answer this way or that way, good? So here is an example. Uh, let's see this last, ex this, this last um, example. So suppose that it's, uh, it's only 10% uh, only of student population knows the right answer to a particular problem. And the problem is given five possible, uh, five possible um, solutions, right? So what would you think? If a person answers it correctly, uh, is it more likely that he knew this? Uh, how does it affect the probability that he knew this uh, answer or more likely that he guessed? You understand what's more likely? If person answered correctly, and this is known about the population, only 10% uh, answer this question or know the, know the answer to this question. And the student, a given student answered it correctly. Does it make it very likely because you know among the 10% or, or did the person guess what's more likely? Okay, you have good intuition, right, guys. Good cold intuition. So here is how uh, we can solve it, right? So by plugging in, we have the formula, right? So M is the number of uh, solutions times probability of knowledge divided by one plus number of solutions minus one times probability of knowledge. So it's five over 14. The, the actual probability that the person knows is only 0 0.36. And, there, and therefore, it's much more likely that the student just guessed, right? Uh, basically about, well, 64% likely the student guessed, good? Well, next question, I will show you what inspired it, but I guess uh, we can call it uh, a day, but I mean by that, uh, that you should stay and we can discuss uh, exam one, two versions of it if you, solved it. If you have questions for it, we can uh, talk about those questions. We can have office hours for it. Exam three is ready, but I haven't posted it because uh, I haven't heard anybody wanting to discuss this, the solutions to the previous exams. All right, guys, if you want to go, good night. If you'd like to stay, we can talk about something. Take care. <laughs>